Das hängt gar nicht mehr so viel. Good morning, CCF. My name is Julie Gum. I'm one of the children's ministry volunteers here, and I know I'm missing your kids as much as the rest of our volunteers, so a big shout out to them if they're watching this morning. And we just want to welcome you no matter where you're watching from, whether it's here in Siloam or around Northwest Arkansas or all over the world. So we're so happy to have you here. We're going to have a great service, and we're going to start with some awesome worship. So wonderful is your unfailing love. Your cross has spoken mercy over me. No eye has seen, no ear has heard, no heart could fully know. How glorious, how beautiful you are. with this love there's nothing 
nothing on earth is as beautiful as you. You've opened my eyes to the wonders of new. You've captured my heart with this love. There's nothing on earth is as beautiful as you. Beautiful one, I love. Beautiful one.
Jesus, your name is power. Hey, thanks for joining us online. My name is Pat Callahan. I'm the lead pastor here at CCF. And we're in the middle of a series called What's Your Story? And it's about our story and our story with Jesus and Jesus' story and, and, and how we fit into God's great story. And I was asked uh, recently by someone, what's the big deal? Why are you so caught up in this whole idea of story? And it actually has to do with the fact that about 75% of the Bible is narrative, 15% is poetry, and only about 10% of it is in instruction and, and proposition. I saw another study that, that looked at it and, and kind of quantitized it a little bit differently, and, and they said, well, it's more like 40 to 50% of it is narrative, about 35% is poetry, and about 15 to 25% of it is instruction and proposition. Well, no matter which chart you look at, either way you, you look at it, about 75 to 90% of the Bible is going to appeal to our, our right brain. It's gonna to appeal to our creative side. It's, it's gonna be metaphoric. It's gonna be about story and poetry. While only about 15 to 25% is gonna to appeal to our left brain, the inductive side of things, the, the you know, three points toward a, a better walk with God or seven ways to be a better disciple of Jesus. And I think sometimes in our Western conservative evangelical way of thinking, we've, we've flipped that around. And for us, 75 to 90% of what we do is, is inductive and, and propositional, uh, while only 15 to 25% of it is metaphor and story. Now, now that's not wrong, but we might want to think about that. Uh, the, the Bible is full of metaphor, full of story. You know, you look at Jesus and, and he's always using metaphor and story. He says things like, the kingdom of God is, is like, uh, or he says, 
In the book of John, he has seven statements he makes, seven I am statements. He says, I am the bread of life. Now, we don't take that to mean that Jesus is made of grain. You know, we get that. We get that. But it's a, it's a metaphor. He also says, I'm the light of the world. That, that doesn't mean that he incandesces or he emits light waves. We, we get that he is using metaphor. And so today in the story we're going to look at, Jesus is going to use another metaphor. Now, before we jump into the story in John chapter 10, uh, I want to kind of take you into some of the historical background because the context of when Jesus is talking is the time of Hanukkah. Now, Hanukkah is a, a Jewish festival that uh, was started in between the Testaments, in between the time of the Old Testament and the New Testament, about 165 BC. And, and it's also called the Festival of Lights or the Festival of Dedication. And so let me jump into the history of that. Some of you may not know that. It's, uh, there's some key players. The first are a group of people called the Hasidim. Uh, they were the traditional uh, the Jews, the people who valued traditional Jewish way of life, traditional culture. Uh, today, we're, we, know them, we know them as Hasidic Jews. Uh, and then there were the Hellenized Jews. Those were the Jewish people in Palestine and Judea at that time that had adopted the Greek way of life and, and the Greek culture. And they had actually forgotten how to speak and to read Hebrew. The, the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Bible was written for those Jews who no longer spoke Hebrew anymore. And they tended to side with the ruling uh, dynasty of the time called the Seleucids. The Seleucids were a Hellenistic dynasty, Hellenistic Greek dynasty that was ruling in Judea around the time of, of Hanukkah, about 168 BC. And the ruler during that time was the villain of the story. His name was Antiochus IV or Antiochus Epiphanes. Uh, he outlawed Judaism. He uh, looted the temple. He desecrated the altar of the temple with pig's blood and then installed uh, a pagan idol of Zeus in the place of the altar. And it was just terrible uh, for those people who, who valued Jewish uh, religion and Jewish way of life and Jewish faith. And, and so finally, uh, the son of, of a priest, the hero in our story, decided to act. And his name was Judas Maccabeus or Judah Maccabee. Uh, Maccabeus was his nickname, and I love this. It means the hammer or the sledgehammer. Uh, and, and historians are split on whether or not that referred to his uh, ferocity in battle, or if that was actually the, the weapon that he used in battle, a hammer or a sledgehammer, or, or maybe both. Uh, they don't know. But what we do know is that on the 25th of Kismet, which on a Jewish lunar calendar will fall somewhere in between late uh, November and early to mid-December, uh, Judas Maccabeus using uh, guerrilla tactics against superior forces, won a number of victories, and finally on the 25th of Kismet, drove the Seleucid forces out of Jerusalem, and he reclaimed the temple. And so Hanukkah is a celebration of that. That's called the, the Festival of Dedication because it commemorates the, uh, the temple being rededicated after it was reclaimed by the hammer. It's also called the Festival of Lights because there's a legend that when they went to the temple, went to relight the menorah, they found that all of the ritual oil uh, had been desecrated by Antiochus, and, but except for one vial, of, one vial of oil was still sealed by the high priest's seal, but it was only enough for one day. And they used it to light the menorah there in the temple and miraculously it burned for eight days. And that's why Hanukkah is celebrated for eight days. Uh, so... You're wondering, okay, that's interesting maybe. Why the history? Well, it's important because Hanukkah is associated uh, with the rebellion. It's rooted in the rebellion against poor leadership. And so when people think of Hanukkah, especially in Jesus' time, uh, only just a few generations removed from actual Hanukkah, they got the, the context of Hanukkah, that it was about traditional Jewish faith and values rising up against uh, foreign invaders and, and against uh, Jews who, who had become like the world and sided with these foreigners. And so Jesus is speaking in our story. He's going to be speaking to leaders, leaders of the Jews. We know them as the Pharisees. Uh, they were 
in Jesus' day, they were the Hasidim. They were the Hasidic Jews, the, the conservatives. They were the ones who were resisting uh, Roman rule and authority in Palestine. They, they also had the greatest influence over Jewish life and culture of that day. But just like some of the rulers in the time of Hanukkah, the original Hanukkah, in the days of the hammer, Judas Maccabeus, uh, the rulers, these Pharisees, were spiritually bankrupt, and, and they didn't even realize it. In fact, that's what we're going to see in the story, that they, they don't have a clue about this. And in our story, there are these layers of meaning and metaphor that Jesus is going to weave into the story that, that has to do with this, this time of Hanukkah. So if you have your Bibles, uh, pop them open to John chapter 10, and we're going to be looking at the first 10 verses. So Jesus is, is it's again, around the time of Hanukkah, late November, early December, and he's speaking to a group of Pharisees, and he says, very truly I tell you Pharisees. Now, let me stop right there for a second, because this is one of Jesus' tells. If you play poker, you know that sometimes people have a, a tell. I know you're not probably not supposed to play poker, but let's just say you did, hypothetically. Uh, sometimes people have a tell, and you can tell what maybe they're holding, holding something good or something bad. Well, other people have tells. I have a tell. Jesus had a tell. And one of Jesus' tells was when he said, uh, truly I say unto you, or, or truly, truly, or very truly, or verily I say unto you. In Greek, it's, it's actually amen, amen. And that was one of Jesus' tells, and it meant, listen up. My tell is, I say, my sons nail me on this all the time. They're like, I say, here's the deal. And I actually do the finger point. Here's the deal. That's my tell for, for pay attention. So here's what he says. Very truly, I tell you, Pharisees, anyone who does not enter the sheep pen by the gate, but climbs in by some other way is a thief and a robber. Now, before we go on, let me, let me tell you about sheep pens and what that would have looked like in, in Jesus' day, in, in ancient times, even actually in modern times. Uh, Bedouins still use this and, and some Arab shepherds. They built a, a pen out in the fields, sometimes up against a, a, a rock wall, uh, been about waist high, this, this, the walls they would build about waist high, and they would put thorns very often on top of these walls, and they'd have a, a break in the wall that was the gate for the sheep to go in and out. And at night, they would either put you know, some more thorn bushes in front of that opening or sometimes uh, some boards. And very often, it would be one of the shepherds or one of the assistant shepherds, one of sort of the shepherding team who would stay there to be the access point by which people could come in and come out. Uh, so sheep couldn't get out accidentally, and people couldn't come in who were nefarious. They would have to climb over the wall, uh, risk the thorns, and, and so they could avoid being seen by the shepherds if they were going to rustle some sheep. And so Jesus says, the one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper, that was the person <clears throat> laying in that opening, opens the gate for him or removes the, removes the wood, removes the bushes in, in front of the gate, and, and the sheep listen to the voice of the shepherd. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. And when he has brought out all his own, he goes on ahead of them, and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. But they never follow a stranger. In fact, they will run away from him because they do not reckon, recognize a stranger's voice. And that's, that's true today. Again, in, in the Arab culture, Arab shepherds, Bedouin shepherds, uh, they spend a ton of time with their sheep and the sheep will know their voice and they can call to their sheep and their sheep will come. Sometimes they'll have a, a little flute and they will play this, uh, a tune. They'll just pick a tune, you know, -doo 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 -doo, and they will play that tune over and over to the sheep. So the sheep begin to know that tune. And when the sheep are in the sheep pen, he'll play it, doo -doo 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 -doo, and then here they'll come. And in that way, groups of shepherds could keep their sheep together at night for safety. And in the morning, when they would let them out to pasture, a shepherd would come and call his sheep or play this little doo -doo 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 tune on the flute, and his sheep would come out because they knew the shepherd. And it says, Jesus used this figure of speech, but the Pharisees didn't understand what he was telling them. They were clueless. It went right over their head. Now, this could be an issue of, you know, the, the Pharisees were city folk and shepherds were mostly country folk, and maybe they <clears throat> didn't really know those customs and traditions. Uh, more likely, it was just they had lost the ability to see the, the poetry and the metaphor uh, that was in the Bible. It was right in front of them as Jesus was sharing. And I think the main reason is really because uh, their hearts were hardened. 
and they weren't open to actually hearing the voice of God. Uh, they, as the New Testament says, they had a form of godliness, but lacked the power thereof. So it says, therefore, Jesus said again, Jesus is, is patient. I love that about Jesus. He says, very truly, again, truly, truly, here it is. Listen up. I am the gate for the sheep. All who've come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep have not listened to them. I'm the gate, and whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and, and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill. The word actually there means slaughter, to steal and slaughter and destroy. I have come that they might have life and have it to the full. There's that verse. We love that verse. I have come that they might have life and have it to the full. The word for life there is the Greek word parason. It means that which goes beyond necessity. I, I, I will give them life more than they could ever need, more than they could ever hope for or imagine. Uh, you could even say it this way. The gift of Jesus is life beyond our wildest dreams. I love that. Now I want to jump back in our passage and, and look at our metaphor a little bit and, and, and begin to break it down. But I want you to notice something I just thought was interesting. We're not going to cover it, but... Jesus identifies himself as the shepherd and the gate, or the gatekeeper. And earlier in the book of John, John says, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Jesus is all three of those things. I love there's this, this shepherd motif that, that runs throughout John's gospel. Also notice that the sheep follow the shepherd because they know his voice. They know his voice. Remember last week we talked a little bit about uh, sound before sight? This is another instance of, of sound and sight. They follow the shepherd because they hear his voice and they know his voice. When they see a stranger, it doesn't say that they ran because they saw the stranger. It says the sheep ran from the stranger because they didn't recognize his voice. And we'll touch on that in a little bit. But I want to jump into this motif about the sheep. Uh, because we're all sheep. We are identified as the sheep in this passage. That's us. Uh, and sheep are supposed to do two things. And it, it all starts, again, with, with hearing. We're supposed to listen to the voice of the shepherd, and we're supposed to then follow where the shepherd leads. And if we do that, if we listen to the voice of the shepherd, and if we follow where the shepherd leads, it says we're going to be protected, we'll be provided for, and we'll have the ability then to recognize strangers and robbers and thieves. But remember, all that starts with listening. It starts with listening. And you and I both know that there's a big difference between hearing and listening. Adam McHugh, in, in a great book, I would highly recommend, it. it's called The Listening Life. He writes, hearing, generally speaking, is one of the five senses that centers on our ears and our brains processing of the sound it receives. Hearing is voluntary and momentary. Hearing is something that happens to us. Sounds force our attention and we obey them instinctually through our body's responses. Listening, on the other hand, is something we choose. Listening is a practice of focused attention. Hearing is an act of the senses but listening is an act of the will. And so as sheep, we need, to, we need to listen. We need to pay attention. We need to know the voice of the shepherd. And how do we do that? Just like the sheep do in the illustration. We need to spend time with the shepherd. And when we spend time with the shepherd, we'll get to know his voice. And we get to know his voice uh, for our shepherd, our good shepherd, we get to know it through Scripture, through the Bible, through reading of the Word, and we also get to know his voice through prayer. As I was thinking about this, about listening to God through prayer, it, it struck me. I, I was thinking, I wonder how much of our prayer time is sort of putting in an order with Jesus, and how much of it is just being quiet and listening. And I know, I know my, own time, my own prayer time, often, <clears throat> it's about Jesus, help me with this, and can you bless me here, or, or can you help this other person, or can you do these things? And often I forget to just sit and listen. 
So when we sit and listen, when we spend <clears throat> time with the shepherd, when we get to know his voice, here's what will happen. We'll follow where the shepherd goes. <clears throat> we'll eat the food that the shepherd gives us to eat. In our story, the shepherd's leading the sheep out to pasture. We know in Psalm 23 that the shepherd not only leads his sheep to pasture, but he, <clears throat> he gets them to fresh water, good, cool, fresh water. We'll drink that fresh water that the shepherd gives us to drink and and we'll do what the shepherd tells us to do. You know, sheep are, there's a reason we're called sheep. Sheep are pretty simple animals. They're, they're not known uh, for being phenomenally intelligent. They're known for often being dumb <clears throat> and sometimes stubborn. And that sounds like me a lot of times. That sounds like some of you a lot of times. And we are those things. We don't have the whole picture that the shepherd has. The shepherd sees more than we do. And that's why we need to follow the shepherd. Because he can see things we don't. <clears throat> he can keep us safe, protected, and cared for. But there's a reminder in this passage that there are other shepherds out there. And boy, there's some strangers who, who might be thieves and robbers, maybe people without the best intention for us as sheep. And so we need to be careful and attentive to listen to our shepherd. <clears throat> we need to know the voice of <clears throat> our shepherd because, because here's the deal. See, I just did it. Here's the deal. Here's the deal. Other strangers may be false shepherds. They, they may look kind of like our shepherd. They may dress kind of like our shepherd. They may Walk kind of like our shepherd. They may say some of the same things our shepherd says. But they'll never sound right. They'll never have the voice of our shepherd. And the Bible says that, that the evil one often comes masqueraded as an angel of light so that he might steal, kill, slaughter, and destroy. But sheep who have their ears tuned to the voice of the good shepherd they need not fear evil, for they know that the good shepherd is with them. And his rod and his staff will comfort them. And they can know when that's a false shepherd and know that they need to get out of there. So that's what we need to do as sheep. Before I'm done, I, I want to talk a little bit to the shepherds among us and some of the shepherds who are watching. Now, maybe you're a shepherd who leads a church as a, <clears throat> a pastor or a staff member or associate pastor or church planter. Maybe you're an elder in your church or a deacon in your church or serve in some other way. Uh, maybe you're a shepherd of a family. You're, you're a parent or a grandparent. Maybe you're a shepherd of a business. You're a own, business owner or a CEO or <clears throat> a supervisor at your work. Maybe you're a shepherd in the field of education. Uh, you're an administrator, a teacher, a professor, an educator. Let me just give you a, a few tips for shepherding the flock that God gave you from this passage. Some, some ways that cues we can take from our good shepherd. The first is this. We need to spend time with the sheep. We, we need to get to know them. We need, we need to be in relationship with them. Good leaders, good shepherds, know their flock. Our passage says that the, the shepherd calls his own sheep by name. I love that. He knows my name. He knows your name. And we should know our people. The flock that God's given you, they're not just numbers. They are people with names. So we need to get to know them. Second tip for our shepherds is this. We need to lead our, uh, our sheep, our flock, to, to good pasture and fresh water. It's all about care and feeding. We need to take care of them. A, a good leader, a, a good shepherd thinks about people, other people, the people they serve, the people they lead, before their own personal ambitions. And then the third thing we need to do as, as good shepherds, whether it's family or church or business or education or wherever you might be, is we need to make sure we're fending off those, those robbers, those thieves, and, and the wild animals. It's all, it's all about protection. We need to protect our flock. Now, I'll tell you who, who's all about this. It's moms. You know about the mama bear thing, right? If you have ever messed with a kid and their mom finds out, 
man, let me tell you, it's over. And it might be your own kid. I, I remember when I was taking my oldest son, Connor, on our first camping trip together <clears throat> up in the high Sierras. We were going to be camping up around 9,000 feet. And I remember my wife, Kelly, said to me before she, we left, she looked at me dead serious, and she's like, if you lose him, don't come home. As God is my witness, I was terrified. I, I thought, please, God, don't let anything happen to this boy on the camping trip. Uh, mama bears are all about protect, protection. If you think about these three tips, relationship, care and feeding, protection, there's a common thread running through all of them, and that's that they build trust. If you want to lead people, if, you, if you've been called to lead people, if God has put you in a spot to lead people, uh, you need to instill trust in them. You need to, to care for them so they will trust you to lead them. And they, if you do that, they will follow you into and through the valley of the shadow of death without fear. Let me say something because it just reminds me of that. In, in the passage, Psalm 23, it says, Yea, though I walk through the valley of shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they come from me. Let me talk about the rod and the staff for a second. The rod was for protecting the sheep against wild, wild animals. It wasn't for beating the sheep. You, you shouldn't be beating your sheep. The staff was for guidance and gentle correction of the sheep. Again, not for beating the sheep. Now, if you're a shepherd... You're going to lose sleep at times. Uh, I mean, in, in our illustration, the shepherd actually sat in the doorway. Uh, he is caring for the sheep. He's the watchman in the night. Uh, if you're going to take care of sheep, you're going to be spending time, lots of time, caring for them, providing for them. If you're a shepherd, at times you're going to get frustrated. You know why? Because you lead sheep. And sheep are not smart. They're dumb animals. Uh, they're stubborn animals. Sometimes they can be just downright stupid. And most importantly, don't miss this. The shepherd in our story leads the sheep. He doesn't drive them from behind. He doesn't push them. It's not like cattle. Our shepherd leads from the front. Our shepherd never asks sheep to sacrifice something that he or she is unwilling to do. So if you're a shepherd... You need to lead from out front. You need to go the places you want your people to go. You go first. You lead the way. You sacrifice first. Don't drive from behind. Good shepherds, great leaders, remember this, always, always, always put sheep, put the mission and vision of their organization before their own personal ambitions. And if you do that, if you're a shepherd, if you've been put in a place either as a leader in a church or your family, uh, your business, uh, wherever you might be. If you put those practices into place, you will be a good shepherd. So sheep, we're all sheep, by the way. We're all sheep, even those of us who've been called to be shepherds. We're all sheep. And we need to know the voice of the shepherd. We need to learn to listen to the shepherd so we can do <clears throat> what he says. And we need to remember that we can trust him no matter where he leads us. We can trust him because he is a good shepherd. And some of us are shepherds, and we need to take cues from the good shepherd. We need to know our sheep. We need to care for them. We need to protect them. We need to put their needs in front of our ambitions, and we need to lead from the front. And all of us, all of us, we need to follow our good shepherd, Jesus, wherever he might lead. Let me pray for us. Uh, God, thank you for this beautiful metaphor of sheep and shepherds and, and gates. And, and we know that in this passage, God, not only are you the shepherd who, who leads us into safety and out into good pasture land, but you are also the access point. <clears throat> and, and we know that it is through you that we come to, into a relationship with God. And so this morning, God, I pray that each one of us would take whatever step of faith we might need to take toward you. Maybe it's being a better listener. Maybe it's being a better follower. Maybe it's being less stubborn when you ask us to do something. And for some of us, maybe it is to take the step through you into your fold. 
And if that's you, my friend, today, I just want to encourage you to give your life to Jesus, to just say, hey, Jesus, today I want to put my faith in you. I believe in you. I believe that you came and you died and you rose again for my sins. You paid the price for all the wrong things I've done. And I want to follow you. And following Jesus doesn't mean we do it right. We're sheep. We're going to make mistakes. We're going to be stupid. We're going to be dumb. We're going to be stubborn. But the good shepherd will be there to lead us and guide us and correct us. And Lord Jesus, may we follow your lead. May we follow your guidance. May we accept your correction in our life. And for those of us who you've called to lead as under shepherds in your care, may we lead our flock well. May we love them and know them and care for them and provide for them. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. We're about to go into a time of communion. Before we do that, we're going to sing another song together. But this would be the great time for you to go, and if you haven't done that already, get whatever you need to take communion together. And we'll be back in just a minute after we sing another song. How deep the Father's love for us, how vast beyond all measure, that He should give His only Son to make a wretch His treasure. How great the pain of searing loss, the Father turns his face away as wounds which mar the chosen one bring many sons to glory behold the man upon the cross my sin upon his shoulders, ashamed I hear my mocking voice call out among the scholars. It was my sin that held him there until it was a has brought me life. I know that it is finished. I will not boast in anything. No gifts, no power, no I will boast in Jesus Christ, His death and resurrection. Why should I gain from His reward? I cannot give an answer, but this I know with all my heart is words that made my rest. I just want to say thanks to Steve and his team for leading us in the music today. We really appreciate all the work that goes into that every week. Thank you guys so much. We appreciate it. 
And now we're going to go into uh, a time of communion. Depending on your background, you may call it communion or the Lord's Supper or even the Eucharist. It is a time where we stop to reflect on the fact of Jesus' sacrifice on the cross for us and, and what he accomplished with his death on the cross. He died for us. Scripture says the just for the unjust once for all that we might through our faith in Christ, receive forgiveness of sins and redemption and relationship with God. And so we remember that today, that, that Jesus' sacrifice made it possible. Really, it was the gate, the door, by which we enter into a relationship with God. We enter into God's flock. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 11, it says, For I received from the Lord... What I also passed on to you, the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's take the bread together now. Paul says, in the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's take the cup together. Let me pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for your sacrifice that paid for our sins, that we might enter the gate, you, the door, you. We might enter into a relationship with God, into his flock, Thank you for accomplishing that for us once for all. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. And now as become our tradition, we're going to recite the Lord's Prayer together. And one of the reasons we do that is it reminds us that we're connected not just together here as a church in Siloam or even the, the church kind of in America, but we are tied to Christians all around the world and all the way back to these very first followers of Jesus. So wherever you are, let's uh, recite the words of the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Well, we're going to move into a time of offering. And I just want to say thank you for all of you who uh, so generously support the ministry of CCF and what God's doing in and through our church. We believe at CCF that generosity is part of our spiritual DNA, that we're all created uh, with that seed of generosity because it reflects the heart of God, for God so loved the world that he gave. And so this morning, if you'd like to give, uh, if you're watching us on our online platform, you can use the giving moment uh, and, and just click on that. It'll take you to our giving portal. Uh, if you want to text to give, you can text the word give to 870-600-3955, or you can go to our website, and scroll down and click give, or just go to ccfsilom.com forward slash give dash online. That's a mouthful. Just go to the website. It'll be a lot easier. Let me pray for our offering, and then we'll close the service. God, thank you for all the faithful people that continue week in and week out, pandemic, pre-pandemic, and even post-pandemic, who, who are just so faithful and obedient uh, to, to respond to your nudging, you're directing in their lives. And I just pray that we would do that now, God, that we would just give whatever you tell us to do as your sheep, that we would follow your lead. And I say thank you in advance for all the people who are going to be impacted uh, for the gospel because of your faithful giving this morning. Thank you, God, for all the people who, who are so generous. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Hey, a couple things before we go. Uh, first, I just want to remind you again to post uh, your Jesus story. Uh, and here's how you do it. We had some confusion about, you know, what, what do you mean? Just take your phone, record your story, your faith story. Here, here's, here's how Jesus came into my life and, 
and here's what Jesus means to me now, and, and here's how he's affecting my life. Just tell us that story, and then take it and post it to your social media page, whether it's Instagram or, or, or Facebook, and just tag it, hashtag CCF Siloam. Then we can, we can look for him, search for him online, and, and watch everybody's story. That will be awesome. The second thing is, Mother's Day is coming up. Next Sunday, wow, next Sunday is Mother's Day. And as of right now, we don't know what, what the governor is going to decide. He's going to decide that tomorrow on churches and, and houses of worship. So kind of keep an eye on our website. And if you're on our email list, keep an eye on that. We will still do, uh, no matter what, we'll still do an online service next week. So you can, you can still tune in. Uh, but we don't know if we'll be meeting together or not next week. We, it's up in the air. But either way... We want to do something great for our moms, whether live or online or both. And so we would love for you to record a video. So if you're a dad, get your kids together and record this video. If you're, if you're a teenager, if you're an adult child, you can do it yourself. Uh, all the details are on our website. If you go to our website, ccfsilom.com, scroll down to events, all the details are there. But here's basically what it is. Shoot it wide. That helps us just for editing. Shoot it wide, you know, like this, not like this. This is better. Uh, shoot it wide. Kind of get up close so we can hear, have good lighting. And then answer these questions or ask your kids these questions. Why do you love your mom? Uh, what makes your mom the best mom ever? And if they don't have an answer for that, just go with what they have. Uh, and What's the best thing about your mom? What, what is the best thing about mom? And then upload it to, to the the deal you're going to see below right now. It's, it's, it's a mouthful. Uh, www.tiny.cc forward slash CCF moms. Now, again, you don't have to remember that. If you'd want to remember it, just make sure the C, the C, the F, and the M are capitalized or that link won't work. But just go to our website. Go to our Facebook page. The links are there. Upload that video to that link. To that, It'll take you to a Dropbox. Upload it to the Dropbox. And let's bless moms next Sunday. Now, important, you got to get this done by Tuesday. That's two days from now. At the end of Tuesday night, it'll be shutting down. Technically, I mean, I think it's open till Wednesday morning. But don't wait till Wednesday morning because once it's done, it's done. And we want to do something cool and fun for moms. So get those videos up. It'll be awesome. Well, so glad you joined us today. Thank you so much for being here. And now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Have a great week, you guys. Bye-bye.